the marinade. There's no O in marinade. Let's try it one more time. Ready? One, <laughs> two, three. <laughs> the marinade. <laughs> marrow. Marrow. Marinade. Bone marinade. The marinade. The marinade. With Jason Earl. What's the deal here, lover? Why do we all suffer? Why do you seem to look away? Have you lost your riches? Are we not your business? Have we all gone astray? Welcome to the marinade. Jason Earl, a free-flowing conversation about the creative process with creative people. This is episode 123, and our guest is D.L. Rossi. Rossi is a singer, songwriter, painter, and all-around creative who makes his home in Grand Rapids, Michigan. His latest record, titled SDNIL, is a huge and triumphant stylistic shift from the album of his that really got my attention, the excellent Lonesome Kind from 2021. Rossi and I have been meaning to catch up for a while, and I'm so grateful we made it happen. We talk about overcoming trauma, the soundtrack that's in your head, taking creative risks, and so much more. This was an absolute blast, and I am so excited to bring it your way. Everyone, my conversation with D.L. Rossi. So I was just like walking back from job interview. So yeah, yeah. Well, hope you didn't freeze. I can't imagine living up there <laughs> this time of year. My one of our like really good friends, dear dear friend, lives in Grand Rapids, and oh, uh, cool. yeah, we're gonna go visit her. She dances uh, for the uh, ballet there. Oh, rad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you've probably seen her on like buses and stuff. They probably you know, yeah. It's like advertisements for the for the ballet so we're gonna go up there i think in like um i forget when april i think so that'll be cool. my first yeah my first trip to michigan so i'm excited for that yeah. let me know uh when you're if you're in town because maybe if you have a free free night or something meet that up, would bro. be great yeah. Yeah. yeah that would be great well dude i'm really excited to talk to you i mean oh, I, me too. i'm i'm fired up like i I think <laughs> Lonesome Kind was probably like when I first got into your music, like really got into it, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and as you know, I just raved about it and continue to rave about it. And then this new record, dude, is just, <laughs> oh my God. I, I'm so excited about it for so many reasons. And one of the big things that I want to just dial, like, like just jump right in, dive right into yeah. is is that stylistic shift and how you have this like very uh, Americana, so to speak record. And then this next record is just a completely different world. And um, I really want to dive into that before we do anything. I would be remiss if I did not congratulate you on your recent matrimony. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. That's awesome, buddy. It, it was really, really fun. Uh, it's it, We had a a fun like week kind of elopement basically that we did so it was it was it was a lot of fun thank you yeah. very much Appreciate yeah it. man yeah for sure um so let's talk about let's talk about this yeah. like what's been what was going on with you as as you were making the record um and yeah. and sort of like where you are creatively in that 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 headspace yeah so uh so lonesome kind was the record that preceded it and and even in that record, there was um, when I had lived in Nashville 
uh, for about three years. Um, my intention when I moved there was to try to grow as much as I could as, as a writer. I wanted to kind of be, my brother had lived in Nashville. I've been going to Nashville my whole life, like cause playing drums and doing different things and like going there to record, going there to play shows. Um, and I, I think even with Lonesome Kind, there was this feeling for me where like, okay, I've been studying Americana, which isn't like the music of my youth. It's not like the style of music I was raised on. It's kind of the music that I started to love and wanted to like, you know, Petty, Springsteen, uh, then David Ramirez, Jason Isbell, these like kind of classics were, you know, what I was there to study. And then kind of as I lived in Nashville, you kind of get exposed to the fact that, oh my goodness, there are so many people doing this music mm. and they're doing it from a place of like, uh, like where they came from. Like this music is their music and you can feel it and like how they, they perform it, how they deliver it. And, um, and as I decided to kind of move back to Michigan and move away from Nashville, there was this feeling within myself of like, okay, the music that like I fell in love with is like weird, like kind of like uh, indie emo music. And like, uh, like just, it still had, the, the, there are folk artists that I really liked and Americana artists that I really liked, but I was like, I'm going to enjoy the music that inspires me, which is a little bit more indie, a little bit more weird. And so when we started doing Lonesome Kind, even in that space, um, I worked with my brother and a producer, Tyler Chester, and I was like, we really don't have to make this like Americana in your face. And that kind of shows up in that record later on. Um, and so that record was well received. A lot of people really liked it. Um, but after I did it, obviously, COVID is still happening mm -hmm. and music is weird. Mm -hmm. And I'm finding myself in this place where, like, uh, I don't really know what to say in this moment in time mm -hmm. uh, as an artist. Like, I don't know what what is it that people need. There's on top of the fact that we're all locked inside of our houses. Um, every artist that I know is releasing music and trying to speak to this thing that we're all experiencing, which is like social and like social unrest and justice. Um, so many different things being, uh, uh, you know, thrown at us at the same time, the election was happening. We're in the middle of COVID. And I found myself being like, I have nothing I feel confident to say. And at the same time, I started listening to a lot of uh, Bon Iver and, I started getting into abstract painting and I was uh, never a big fan of his music before, like mm. just never drawn to it. I always thought I listened to it and I was like, this is amazing. But I think in the middle of that space, what I found myself kind of feeling was, is like, oh, this music's awesome because you don't always know what Justin Vernon's trying to say, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's expressing something. And as I got into abstract painting, I was like, oh, I shut my brain off. I turn on instrumental music and I, and I create something from in here somewhere, like in 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 myself somewhere, but I'm not conscious of like what the thing is that's going to come out. And so I had moved into a new house and kind of had creative space for the first time that I could just like create in. And I just started playing around and I started doing things that I, I honestly didn't even know what I was doing half the time. I would like pull up a, a sound on a MIDI controller and just mess around with it until I found something that I liked. And then I started messing around with like vocal effects. And the first probably six songs that I wrote were just like, obviously ideas. But then I started sending stuff to my brother and he was like, oh, this is a thing. You should keep doing it. Um, and yeah, it it honestly was kind of like this weird therapy, I guess, the record. <laughs> yeah. Because it was... I felt uniquely at the time in the space that was going on in the world. Um, I had no idea what to say to comfort anybody. Hmm. Um, and I feel like that's, you know, uh, and I guess in a way, I guess you should, I should push that inward because I didn't know how to comfort myself, I guess, mm -hmm. other than to create. Um because I really do. I mean, I, I create for others, but I think there's a selfishness that's developed in me over the years where I've kind of realized that creating is a necessity for me because I've been doing it for so long. It's kind of like how my body 
relaxes and processes and and works through things. And so that the record, that's a really long answer, but um, it's a great answer. Yeah. The record for me was just like, I guess it was the beginning of exploring how to feel better about what I'm in the world. Yeah. I, yeah. okay. So a couple of things, so many things come out of that, but a couple of things I want to key in, in on here. And one is what I'm hearing from you is a sense of almost responsibility to your, the people consuming your art that you feel like as an artist, you feel a little bit, is, is that accurate to say that you feel a little bit of like a responsibility to the people who are going to be consuming those songs? Yeah. I mean, I think that there's a responsibility for me to give something that is authentic and true to myself. Mm. And, and if I'm in conflict and don't, I, I never want to release something that I think is like a lie right yeah and 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 i've been and the the i guess the thing with the americana thing for me is 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 that like i had kind of like locked into a, a routine of like well i can write a song in a day if i need to mm-hmm. but taking away all of the instruments that i like am used to doing in the format that i was used to doing it uh, i guess allowed me to be vulnerable in the way of saying uh <laughs> rather than i guess writing like a like a an Americana song about like, I don't know what to say right now. <laughs> That's open ended, right? Let's like kind of like, cause I already have a tendency to write the sad guy music, mm. right? So like in, in that you have to like have a narrative that isn't just like, you know, uh, nothing is ever going to get better. You, you, that's not, you don't want that to be like what you share with people as an artist, like on stage, when you perform the songs, you'd want to have a conversation with the audience that is like pushing them towards uh, may, not always. It doesn't always have to be positivity, but at least it's like I'm honestly sharing something with you that hopefully you honestly accept. And then we both feel something in that interaction. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I think what I feel is a responsibility as an artist to like understand that I am creating something that's going out into the world and I need to feel that that's coming from an honest place. And so that was like, the weird thing is, is like, I I was trying to write kind of in the same vein that I wrote before. And I was like, I don't really know what to say to people Mm. like in that format of like grabbing a guitar and playing like a few chords and telling a story or sharing something about myself. Um, I think too, like, obviously I think everybody, I was like just really struggling with like anxiety and depression at that time. And so I think that was also a big factor. Um, Yeah. Is there like, this makes me think of something that I've been processing lately, which is kind of like at this stage of my life, I'm thinking a lot about identity and, mm-hmm. and, and sort of wrestling with who I am, who I have been, and then who I sort of want to be. Um, and like, I think there's sort of a soundtrack in my head to to that identity and i think for me as someone who was born in kentucky who grew up in central florida it is an americana soundtrack it is like jason isbel and sturgill simpson kind of like that's the soundtrack to my life not just that i consume does that make sense like like what i sort of hear in myself and at this moment i'm trying to uh, sprinkle in a little more john prine like a little more kind of like joy and silliness and playfulness. That's something that I'm really focused on with. Do you have a similar soundtrack? And if so, like, what is that? Yeah. I mean, I think so the, I, I I mean, there's eras in my life where like um, my background is very much like I was raised in Metro Detroit um, in a suburb homeschooled, uh, Mm. Christian, conservative values, very loving home, you know, like surrounded by loving people, but a very like uh, uniform view of how things should be. And then backed up with like apologetics training and all of these reasons why what we believed was right and everyone else was wrong. Same. There was a lot of that in my, in my, and, but what the, the, I think what happens in that is, is, is that like in the back of your mind and the back of your heart, there are things where you're like, well, I don't, I mean, 
okay, I don't know if this is me, but I I can be this if I if I work hard enough or if I like listen or if I learn or if I oh, you know, follow the rules, like eventually this will start feeling better. And so I think for me there was like this turn where like the first the first time I heard music and it blew my mind was Jimmy Eat World's Clarity. That was the first time I heard a record where I was like, oh, my God, what is mm-hmm. going on? I don't even know how to express how this album makes me feel from front to back mm-hmm. um, because of what was going on musically and what Jim Atkins was like expressing vocally in those songs. There was just something in me that felt freeing. Uh, but then like, I definitely like kind of found my way to guys like David Ramirez and Jason Isbell through the like Pedro, the lion, David Bazan path of, you know, and then there was a, there's a Christian guy named Derek Webb, who's kind of like Christian guy or like Christian people uh, beginning to folk music in a way for our generation. And so for me, I mean, the, definitely the records were, you know, like <clears throat> Southeastern the first time I heard that. And those things uh, are like albums like that. Um, I fell in love on the road when I was a guitar tech, our bus driver um, kind of like retroactively educated me because I wasn't raised on like good Americana and classic country music. And so I adopted a lot of songs, but I mean, if, if I'm being honest, the music that I grew up on was like, it was like David Bazan, uh, and th- then, um, uh, Ben Gibbard, mm. <laughs> um, and then, uh, guys like Pete Yorn, which I guess that's where like the Americana thing comes in. But the, I think the interesting thing about my, when you say soundtrack, there's like a split that happened in my life where, uh, and it was the beginning of like the Americana thing for me was I had done, my first record was like this very David Bazan inspired thing when I was still working in a church. And that record, uh, I was asked to leave. Well, I was given the option to leave or stay based on whether or not I released that record. And uh, from after that happened, I went through like a really rough depression, uh, went through a first marriage, tried to kind of salvage my life within the church after that, and then kind of realized that like I there's not a place for me in that world that feels good based on like um, abuse, like spiritual abuse that I went through, yeah. which just like existing in that space was too painful for me to like be. So there's a lot of anger and a lot of stuff. But on the other end of it, as I was, I came back to music, <laughs> And uh, I think the weird thing is, is like I said to that soundtrack that I grew up on of like Bazan and all these people was, I don't want to like, I want to move forward from where I was and I want to find new music that is, and and I want to speak the way people like Petty and Springsteen did in a way that like unified people and told stories that weren't for like this niche thing where like there's a, When you're post evangelical Christian, there's an angst that exists in like holding on to it. Like, like that's like in David Bazan's music, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, or there's like an anger. And for me, I had gotten to a point in my life where I was like, I don't want either one of those things in my life. I, I want to accept that that existed and move forward. And so I guess the weird thing for me is, is I feel like every year or two, I find new music and I'm actually like in this habit of like, I'm going to adapt this as the thing that I see life through right now. I'm going to like, and so like the last, if you looked at my Spotify numbers, it was like, uh, I think I listened to the I comma I record, like almost exclusively along with some of my friends instrumental music from Nashville. Like that was like, I wasn't listening to a lot of music outside of that. And I was just focused on creating. I don't know if that answers the question, but like, that's, that's how it it feels. (laughs) I'm not sure whether it answers the question either, but let's, I'm going to turn this into a therapy session for myself. (laughs) So (laughs) my, (laughs) my, my post evangelical life, Very similar. I I resonate, like what you just said resonates with me on a great deal, except that I think it sounds like I got, I left a lot earlier. Like basically as soon as I got out of high school and got to college, I was like, oh shit, I have been, I have been taught some really awful, 
awful things. And the church is responsible for so many of these awful things. And I held on for a long time to my, my faith, mostly out of fear. Yeah. And, you know, and, and I think existential fear that, yeah. you know, is, is so, is so drilled into you in the church, in the evangelical church growing up. And at this place in my life right now, especially as my parents age and I see them holding on to that and how much, how detrimental it is to their happiness and health that they're holding on to it. I feel anger. And what's been so helpful for me, at least in dealing with that anger is the fact that I do. And a lot of people listening to this will attest to this, that I, I know a lot of really wonderful artists who left the church per se, but are Christians. And that is something that has helped snap me out of my anger that almost borders on like a deep prejudice against yeah. Christianity and Christians, um, knowing so many sweet, kind musicians that – I don't want to name here in case they don't necessarily want me to say it that way, but there are so many folks who are friends of mine who make beautiful music, who are so kind. And yeah. to me, it's like my experience was like, these were the meanest people. <laughs> these were like the most racist, yeah. you know, meanest, no, yeah. homophobic people. And that, that, and that yeah. manifests from, in my journey right now is anger. And so it's really good to hear you say that like, you're, you're not, you d decided not to go that way. Right. Cause that anger is not productive. Yeah. Yeah, I think one of the – so I think – in I've been through a lot of counseling. Um, but I think one of the things that I guess I identified – and I, and this is a really, I think, weird uh, way to look at it. Or maybe it's not weird. I just – I think it's abstract. It's an abstract way of thinking about something is, is, is that um, – well, I guess the first thing that I, I learned in counseling that I've tried to like uh, – just make a part of my everyday life is, is that people don't learn behaviors because they don't work for them. They learn behaviors because they work. Mm. Right. And so people believe in Christianity because it works for them on some level. Right. And so if you want them to stop, like, if you want to take on the responsibility of trying to change someone and like, do the, like, like I'm going to change the world thing, the, the it's it's a really tough thing to do a but then b what i realized is is that that is exactly what i was trained to do by the church so mm -hmm. to be evangelical if that makes sense mm -hmm. so i didn't what what and i found that that was the thing that was the most damaging about all of the things because if you ask somebody who is any of the things that you just listed that are so negative prejudice racist homophobic all of these different things their justification is, is based on what they believe God is telling them, right? And so they believe that what they're doing is, is like this big work of changing people's minds. So I was literally raised to when somebody talked to me, subconsciously start picking apart what they believe so that I can change them. Yep. So just because I stopped believing in like the literal stuff, right? That behavior in me didn't actually go away. Like... I was still trying to change people's minds, right? And it was in counseling where I was like, oh, I need to get out of this whole idea where it's like my responsibility to save the world mm -hmm. and like change people's minds and like prove to them that what they believe is like wrong because that is like all I'm doing is taking everything I was taught when I was an evangelical, right? Mm -hmm. And flip it around and I still have all of the same anxiety and all the same angst because I'm still thinking about, oh, well, this new belief system is the right thing. And I have to evangelize this to the world and I have to do all this. It was like a, well, no, I, I think I need to take time to like figure out what's going to work for me. Mm -hmm. And then if people open up to me and allow me to have a conversation with them, I can share. But I also don't ever want to become somebody that I used to be where like I enter into conversations like if we were talking I would walk in as an evangelical thinking like, hopefully this person has their life together. And if they don't, I'll be here to help that person. Mm -hmm. 
right? Where now it's like, I don't want to enter into conversations with people that way. Like, I want to listen to them. I want to hear from them. I want to learn. Uh, and I don't want the responsibility of another person's life on my hands. And so like, I don't, yeah, it's a, um, and, and I don't mean that like in a, I don't care about anybody else. Like I, I have huge amounts of empathy and love for the people around me. And I want to be a, a person that helps and that mm -hmm and that fights for people in that way but i guess like if you're raised evangelical the way that i was there's like this extra level where like you literally walk into every room thinking you have to save people yeah that's a huge weight to live with yeah do i yeah. yes yes all of that and i i do that with politics now i i do you know i do it with politics now i, I do it with race now i because mm -hmm. i was raised in that particular way and i've spent the bulk of my adult life trying to undo the things that I was taught about people of color and trying to read as much as I can, educate myself as much as I can, become as awake as I possibly can to the realities of systemic racism. And I do walk into conversations. I don't, I never really thought about it until you just said that, but I do walk into conversations thinking I'm going to convert people to, you know, seeing the world through the, the the glasses that I now see it through, uh, especially having grown up the way that I did. And some of that's not bad, but at the same time, like instead it's really helpful to, to process that and to think through it in creation too, like bringing it back to creativity oh, yeah. and creation yeah. too. Right. Almost nothing I write and, and do podcast wise, almost everything includes a hint of what I'm talking, what we're talking about right now, a hint of my hope that someone hears it and I changed their heart in some way, yeah. almost everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it's, but I think that that part of it, right, isn't that part of it kind of like our, that's our desire to connect with each other and feel yeah. seen, right? And I think that that's the, um, I think that there's there's kind of like two things to it. There's like, so there was a part of, the way that I understood one of the reasons why I broke away from like other things that I like past beliefs is, is that there was like this honest love and this honest want to connect with people and this honest thing that was like a part of it. But then there was like the responsibility piece and like the work and all, all that stuff. And so I think like the, that's where I kind of go back to what I was saying earlier about not knowing what to write and having the responsibility of wanting to say something true and honest Mm -hmm. And the reason why I want to say something true and honest is because like, that's how you have a conversation with somebody, right? Mm -hmm. You can start a conversation and throw out a bunch of facts, pretend to be interested in somebody else and kind of even lie. But at the end of the day, you're not going to build a relationship with that person that's like built on anything that's like going to last and it's going to help you mm -hmm. grow. So like as a songwriter, <clears throat> I think for me, what I've identified my strength is is I, I'm not telling people anything anymore that isn't a conversation that I'm having with myself about how I need to change. It's mm. not like, I'm not like Dylan, you know, Bob Dylan, where like, I'm this visionary person that's like, God is like finger on the pulse of like the cultural zeitgeist or whatever you want to say. Like, that's not who I am. Like I wasn't out writing songs when I was in my twenties changing the little literal landscape of like folk music. Um, for me, it comes from like this place of like, oh, okay, like let's have an honest conversation within myself. And uh, hopefully it hits in a way that like then has a benefit from other people, but the benefit is less about changing their mind and more about making them feel seen while I'm feeling seen, I guess in that way, right? Is that they, they relate to that. And then from there, it's, that's where once I feel like you get people's uh, trust, then you can start maybe having conversations in your art about um, deeper stuff. And and I try to put that into each record as well. It's just like, yeah. Man, that's so great. That's all really beautiful and helpful. <laughs> um, the, the word abstract has come up a couple of times and you um, have been painting abstract paintings you've been making these wonderful videos you know diving into video production and editing and that kind of thing um 
and and this record again circling back is stylistically pretty abstract and yeah. a lot lot different from what we've come to expect from your records um how comfortable were you kind of making that shift doing all yeah. this abstract work i think um i i definitely it started out I mean, I, I guess it's not even, it, it was really great actually. Cause I, so mm -hmm. I've never had a space that is like totally mine to like create in the sense of like having like a house, having like places I can walk into like behind me is the studio and like have it set up so that like I can track guitars right here. I can turn around and play drums and then I can go over here. And then I, can... I've always done records the very Nashville way. Mm. of like uh write a bunch of songs get the ideas fleshed out go into the studio and know what you're doing you know what i mean because you, that's just like how you have to do it and there's nothing wrong with that uh, but i guess i was able to step into something where i started playing around and then i was just like i i really like this this is fun and i think the biggest thing about it was is because i wasn't going into it like with a preconceived idea of anything i'd literally like play a beat put something together bring a mic over and start singing something mm. and a lot of the record is literally the the like it, there was nonsense being said while I figured out m melodies, but then as soon as I had a melody, I just kind of turned on my like stream of consciousness songwriter and would just do a pass, go back, switch a couple words that I didn't like, move on. And those ended up being like the vocals that are on the record. Wow. Um, and it was, and I think too, because like I started doing this with not the intent that I was going to release it. It was like, I'm going to start just doing this because it feels good. Mm -hmm. And I don't re and at the time I was very much like, I don't really know what's going on with music. I mean, this was this record was started when like shows are were in like insanely difficult to make happen. Mm -hmm. And then when you did the amount of effort it took to try to get people to come to the show and then the end result, like I was almost I, I and it's kind of the hangover from COVID for me is is like shows are I didn't do them for so long that shows have become increasingly difficult to like step out and do as much. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, Oh, I can be here though. And I can create, and I can do all these things and just feel free to, mm -hmm. I mean, I would spend a day on a song that ne like I would spend a day on an idea and then just like, well, it didn't go anywhere today. Let's start a new idea the next day. It was a very, like, it was very comfortable. It was very free. That's so inspiring. I, I, you know, I'm an educator by trade. That's how I pay the bills. And, um, I have a mentor. His name is Warren Buck. He's one of the greatest people I know. And, uh, he really harped on physical space at when, when I was teaching, he was very serious about utilizing physical space, utilizing the classroom to be a place that is inviting to learning that kids feel yeah. safe they feel intellectually, emotionally, and physically safe in that will spark their creativity that will, um, that will, uh, allow for efficiency and same, same kind of thing. My partner and I both like, she now has her own art studio and she's a visual artist yeah. and she has her own studio where she, and, and her, and a garage where she can build things like this Murphy bed that she built and oh, the, awesome. and the, the Jason is will inspire mural that when you pull that down is inside of it, you know, Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. She surprised me with it on my birthday. I went to a music yeah. festival, um, in, in, uh, live in, uh, down in um not live oh goodness lake wales florida i went to a music festival and i came back and this was the most magical weekend right i come back yeah. and she had she had a sticker on it that said like that it was broken like not <laughs> to use it because it was broken and uh so i didn't i followed you know i'm i'm coachable and then finally <laughs> she was like she surprised me with it and it's like the stained glass you know the isbel's like stained glass yeah. kind of aesthetic that's on the live at the ryman yeah. anyway all of that stuff like she was making stuff when we had our little apartment and so was i but i would have to like go out in the car to record intros to the yeah. show and like if i we weren't doing zoom back then but if i had a phoner i had to like make sure the ac was off and like yep. here i have this space where this is my space to make stuff and yep. 
the lessons that I learned from as a teacher and how important it is as a facilitator of learning to have a physical space that's meaningful. The same thing is true as a creator. So I'm really excited for oh, you that yeah. you have that, you know? Oh, it, it changed. Um, I mean, I love, so I, mean, I love studio work. I, I love being in studio with like musicians. I love, um, you know, that interaction, but the, the, the time constraint that happens mm -hmm. on me, the artist, like the artists that are in the studio there to play those, those guys, the playing guitar, drums, the girls, everybody, there's a time constraint. And so the other interesting thing about this record that was so great was um, one of my, uh, he played on, uh, he's a uh, guitarist and uh releases his own music john uh juan salazarno is uh this really really great guitar player um artist musician and um he had played on lonesome kind and uh i started sending him stuff saying hey what do you think of this would you want to just lay stuff in your house and like you just do it in your own time like i'll pay you day rates whatever you need to do but just like you know whenever you get to it i know you're busy you're probably doing other things and he was like, yeah, yeah. And um, at the beginning of it, it was interesting because it almost like took us a little bit in conversation for him to believe what I was saying. When I said to him, I was like, this is an idea I have. I have no notes for you. You just make something and I'm going to use it. Like, I'm not I'm mm -hmm. I'm not like going to tell you to change something. And, um, and he would send me a few things and he would be like, what do you think about this? And it's like, I don't know if I'm happy with it or not. And I was like, man, I think that's a really, really great idea. I love it. Like that's, that works for me. And then once we kind of built up the trust of like, oh, you're just like, you're literally wanting me to just go on this. We were having conversations and he would even be like, oh, I'm going to, I got an idea today. I'm going to like do some more. And there was this interesting thing that was happening was, is like, we weren't to this point of like being constrained to like boundaries, space, and not being able to be inspired. There's this interesting thing that happened even with him afterwards that we talked about it. He was like, this was one of my favorite um, projects to do like not in a studio, like just sending files. He's like, because we were just like going mm. and I was just creating in my own space at home. And he was like, it taught me to like doing remote work Cool, because it was just like this experience. And for me, that was like the best thing for me to hear because I was like, because I was going through this experience of like, I don't have any ideas for this. I'm just creating as I'm going. There's no vision for like where we're headed other than like what happens. Mm -hmm. And the there's some tracks on the record that literally, if you went to the original demo and then you went and saw what like Juan, what uh, Ross McReynolds and um, everybody else who, who played on the record, um, they like, they started going so hard because I was like, yeah, just do what you want to do. I trust you. And I'm asking you because I believe in you. Like uh, there's a song called Afterthought that was just an acoustic track and like an electronic drum part with some synth. And like the guys went nuts on it. <laughs> like mm. they went absolutely crazy. Um, and I loved it. <laughs> and I was like, dude, and they were like, what do you think of this? Is this too much? And I was like, no, <laughs> because this is what you guys felt based on the song. Like, and, and, you know, my brother who, who's produced all my stuff and mixed all my stuff did a lot of like hard decision-making, but I trust him with that where he was just like, all right, we're going to, we're going to piece this together. Cause there was probably too much all together in the tracking when I sent it uh, to him. Uh -huh. But like, the 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 whole idea of just kind of like going because of like and I felt the inspiration like what you're talking about from the space that I was in I was able to just basically be like yeah let's just I'll be here tomorrow and I'll be writing something else and let's just do it but you only get that you can get into that rhythm when you have that space and you and and time too which I you know I was lucky to have the time to be able to be like investing just like daily into writing, which was like a huge, huge blessing for me as well.
Gosh, it's awesome, man. It's really inspiring just to think about a, a couple of things there. One, that trust in the creative uh, process, collaborating with someone and trusting them fully. And not only are you trusting them, but you're communicating to them that you trust, right? You're communicating yep. clearly to them that you believe in them. And that is a really great headspace to be in if you're making stuff, right? Is like, if I have someone saying, I want you to go do this thing because I know it's going to be great, whatever it is. And I don't want to put parameters on you. I want you to do what you need to do. What a gift that you've given those folks. Like what a, a great lesson in leadership, in uh, in collaboration. It's just such a beautiful thing to hear. And it comes out so beautifully on record. Yeah. Um, I think part of it, comes from me is like having been like I grew up as a drummer in a band with my brothers and then I was like a drummer in other bands like a hired gun guy and then I was a guitar tech on the road with some bands and I think like when you live behind like behind the front right like I, I kind of like never really wanted to be like a singer songwriter front and center person i loved being in a band with my brothers i can't even like i started writing for my older brother to sing mm. like i loved that process um and but then it was i was pushed by people to be like you you really need to like release your own music and you really need to do this and and and, and i'm glad that they did but there's always been a thing for me where it's like i've been in the studio with people who are like geniuses musically and that is not like my strength. Like I, mm -hmm. I, I've settled into this idea. I, I write well, and that is like where I, and then I'm adequate in all other ways of like doing me. <laughs> like mm -hmm. I can mm -hmm. make something sound like me. Sorry, I don't know what happened. My my <clears throat> my computer just closed all the windows. <laughs> yeah, it, it, you didn't do anything. It's that we are a DIY operation over here, so we don't pay for Zoom. Oh. <laughs> So it cut, cuts you off after 40 minutes. No, yeah, but yeah. You were, you were on a roll. Usually I will tell the guests like, hey, it's about to end. Let's yeah, rejoin yeah. the same yeah, link. But you were on a roll. And I was yeah, like, I don't. I'm sorry. I, it's sort of like when your gas tank is on empty, but yeah. you're like, I can get 10 more miles out of this, baby. This. We can do it. Yeah, I, I don't even actually remember. Oh, wait, I was on like a thing about letting people create. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think I just found that, oh, like, so I know where my, like, I, I think that's something that uh, you learn by being in studios and creating. Mm -hmm. So uh, I have I have a lot of friends um, whom I love um, who show me a lot of music, especially, like, before. Um, and, uh like when I was younger, this was like when I was around younger, like spending all your time going out to eat and going to bars and going to shows and like hanging out with people. Mm -hmm. There's always like those friends and I love them. And I think that they're extremely creative, but they would always be like, I have this idea. What do you think about it? And, you know, you sit in the car and they play you a verse and a chorus. And mm -hmm. I'd always just say the same thing. I got into this habit of saying the same thing, which was like, I love this idea. You have to finish it before you start judging it like mm. you can't keep listening to this verse in this chorus saying whether or not it's going to be a good song unless you like go in and do it and because like i've just kind of consistently been like i'm going in the studio these are the songs i have i'm going to keep recording i've had this opportunity to work with all of these artists and gain the perspective of like okay here's where i fit in this is my 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 role and what my role is as the artist who is even hiring all of these people to to play on this record, but it is not, I am not here to like hire these amazing musicians and then tell them what to play, right. whose job it is to do studio work every day. Yeah. Now there is a danger and I get the danger of like, you pay money for some people who you don't have a relationship with and they're just there to like get, do their licks, play their parts and get out of the studio. You do not want to like find yourself in that situation, but that's why it's like, the people that have played on my last few records were guys that I would go to the basement, the basement East, just to see them play. If I knew they were playing with another artist, mm -hmm. like I would go see Ross and Juan and, <clears throat> and will, and like the people that have played on my records and Calvin and, 
um, if I knew that those guys were playing, I would be like, I'm going because I like them. And so I, and I would go up to them. We weren't even, didn't even have relationships. I just be like, dude, that was such an amazing show. And then when I finally connected with them, I was like, Hey, I saw you here. Would you want to play on this record? It's like, Oh yeah, I remember you because I'd been to like a few wow. shows. Right. And, but like, that's how I can walk into the studio though and trust somebody is because like, I am already a fan of what you do. And for me, I'm more excited to see what you do do with my music because I've done everything that I can do. Yeah. Like you're going to take it and do something with it that I can't even see coming. And for me, that's kind of like the, the fun in the creating is like finding the people that you love, like you love their art and you're like, please create on my record. And then it's just a, a joyful thing because, but it does come from that thing of like, and it comes as you get older, I think of just being like, I'm not walking into the studio trying to like sing in like these really high keys and do like hard rock anthems, you know, like I'm my I'm taking care of my part of the equation. And so it allows everybody else to kind of do their thing. There's so much self-awareness there. There's so much self-awareness and understanding sort of what will you bring to the table and then also in turn how you can empower other people to bring their essence and their thing to the table. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think at the end of the, so I think that this, so when I was in Nashville and this is like a way over general generalization, mm -hmm. but there were, I, I often found, I found two types of artists that I would walk into, like that I would meet and have a conversation with. And there were people that want to be like entertainers that want to be like, and they're good songwriters too. I'm not saying this to say they don't have something else, but they're like, they want to be on stage. They want to entertain. They feel as though literally that what they have to say is like going to change the world. And then there's like songwriters who are like, I almost don't know why I do this, but I have to do this. I have to tell these stories. I have to like, I have to mind vomit every week about something I experienced because it's just who I am. And I don't even know how I, like songwriters, like, I don't even know how I feel about that part of me because it's just like, sometimes it's difficult and I'm not necessarily comfortable singing in front of, you know, s stages and stuff like that. And so I, I like, for me, it was getting comfortable with the idea of like, oh, this is who I am. I admire all of my my friends even who are like clearly meant to be in front of arena stages. I'm kind of like over here, you know, mm -hmm. like where I I am a fan of a lot of music. I like going, I loved going to shows in Nashville. The best thing about living in Nashville was just like every night you could just be like, oh, this local artist is playing here. I could just go and experience that. And, um, and, and again, I don't make those distinctions to say one's superior. I just think that like, I came to that realization in my own brain where I was like, oh, I'm not one of those people that like wants to be at an arena. You know what I mean? Like I, I love going to go see shows at like the basement in Nashville yeah. with the small rooms. And, and I, I don't know that I, maybe that's just like getting older, right? Like, it's mm -hmm. just like kind of get more aware of who you are yeah are there any uh are there any shows you could think of where you saw like um somebody at the basement or wherever and then now they're like playing you know big big concert halls or arenas one of those fun uh, like tyler children's in a coffee shop kind of stories you know i'm trying to think about i was like a big fan of like the like the nashville like songwriters that were around my age younger um but i guess one of the craziest things that happened i wasn't even aware of who they were this is like me being kind of lame but there's <laughs> like uh and i became a huge fan after seeing them um but i got a call from a road manager um that on a day off and he was like yo i have an extra ticket to go see gang of youths at the basement <laughs> And I was like, who's that? And so like, I listened to their music and like, I show up and it's completely packed. And obviously they, they're, they were on their way up and now they're huge. Yeah. 
but it was insane to like be in that room and like experience a band like that in such a small like i don't think like it was like a secret show kind of a thing it's like people didn't like but it was completely packed out um i i never like had the experience though of like walking into a room and seeing somebody who's now like huge uh i i have the experience of like going to go see people that i still think like should be yeah oh my god <laughs> you know what i mean like i have i could give you like you know, five people off the top of my head that should be like, you know, touring like that. Um, Who are those five? Oh, uh, I would give you, uh, there's a singer songwriter named Carl Anderson that I think is absolutely amazing. Uh, Colin Elmore is another one. Uh, my old roommate, Ruben Bedez. Um, a guy named Charlie Witten, who's this like amazing guitar player um, and uh, singer songwriter. Um, and wow. There's, uh, I mean, I'm, I've said Juan a lot, but like Juan, uh, Juan to me is like one of the most like amazing musicians and he plays guitar for everybody, mm. uh, but he releases his own music and, uh, him and Ross actually released this, uh, instrumental record. Uh, that's both of their names, Ross McReynolds, uh, Juan Salazarno, and it's called instrumentals and it's just them doing stuff. And they're like, People kind of know who they are, you know what I mean? But it's like, in my mind, they're like, they should be massive, you know what I awesome. mean? Awesome. Yeah, great. Well, we usually end on what you're getting down on. That might be a good way to like, um, those. Fo that, that's plenty of homework right there for folks is to yeah. to go <laughs> go check them. Me too. Well, I don't, actually, I don't one, know. one of the funnest things is, so Colin, Carl, and Ruben are actually in this like super group called Cabin Boys. That is also like a, a pretty fun project. It's for if you're into traveling like Wilburys, it's basically like every song has like four to five part harmony, like definitely vibing like with a country twang, but like in that vein, that's pretty amazing. Um, cool. Yeah. Oh, very yeah. cool. Man, I could talk to you all day. This has been <laughs> such a pleasure. I feel like I've, I've, we had a therapy session. You, you turned me on to new music. You told me about your beautiful record. You've given me more than I could possibly ask for. Um, and I'm really excited that you agreed to do the inner child segment. So this will, yep. for folks listening, this will be the end of our conversation for now, but for $2, $2, that's it. $2 a month. You can join our Patreon. Right, it's so easy. It's it's, a, it, it's less than a cup of coffee, right? Yeah. Can, can join our Patreon and hear the rest of our conversation. DL Rossi, y'all. Thank you so much. Thank all of you for listening. DLRossi.com for all things DL Rossi. MarinadePodcast.com for all things the marinade, including written pieces, photography, our online store, and more. Follow us on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. Subscribe and give us a five star rating on your podcast app. Tell a friend about the show. These are all free ways to support the marinade. If you really like what we're doing, please consider joining our Patreon community, where for just a few bucks a month, you can gain access to Patreon-exclusive content like our show, Jason's Journey, where I talk about the moments that shape my creative life and provide a window into the process of making the marinade. We have a brand new monthly show called What We're Getting Down On, which is a conversation between me and my good friend Peter Haroldson. The first episode is available for free at patreon.com slash marinade podcast. It's also on our regular podcast feed. We're going to record another one at the beginning of February. Check it out and let us know what you think. It's a lot of fun to make, and I'm really excited that Peter and I are doing this once a month. Also, check out our show, Inner Child, where I ask our guests childlike questions such as favorite food, 
TV show, etc. Stuff like that. Uh, my inner child with DL Rossi is now live on Patreon, and we had so much fun during that conversation. Patreon.com slash marinade podcast if you're interested. If you want to support the show financially, but you don't want to commit to a monthly subscription, I totally get that. You can Venmo or PayPal us at The Marinade. All the money goes right back into making the show, and that means saving up for festivals, um, saving up to, to travel, to meet artists in um, different locations. We've been invited to some very cool events, and we got to figure out how to pay for them, y'all. So if you can swing it, we appreciate it, but... More than anything, we're just thankful that you listen. We're thankful that you spread the word. We're thankful that you interact with us on Twitter and Instagram and TikTok and all those places, emailing us. We appreciate that too, marinadepodcast at gmail.com. If you just want to drop us a note, those things go a long way, y'all. They mean a lot to us, and we're super grateful for every single one of you who listens. Until next time, go out and create something. Cheers, y'all.